Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I think we're ready to begin. My name is Wayne Arden. I'll be your host for this evening. I would first like to introduce to you Professor William Selecki. Uh, just a bit of um, introduction about his uh, research efforts. His research has focused on urban environmental change, resilience, environmental transitions generally, and urban climate vulnerability and adaptions specifically. He has served as leader or co-leader of numerous international, national, and local climate impact studies and assessments, including on several local, serving on several local, national, and international science committees and panels. He is co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, the NPCC, and he most recently served as a lead author on the UN's IPCC, that's a famous uh, organization, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, AR6, this, that means the sixth assessment, the most recent one, uh, working group two, chapter 17 on decision-making options for managing risk. He is a co-founder of the Urban Climate Change Research Network, UCCRN, that now includes approximately 1,500 members and is co-editor of the recent Climate Change and Cities Assessment Report, ARC3, published by Cambridge University Press. He also serves as the co-editor of the journal's Current Opinion in Environmental Sustainability and the Journal of Extreme Events. His PhD is in Geography from Rutgers University, awarded in 1990. Professor Selecki, the um, floor is yours. Thanks. Maybe I'll, is it okay if I'm supposed to do the mic? I have to make something. Whatever works. Well, But be here. I'll be here. I have to look up here just in case so I know what, what slide I'm on. So, anyway, uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, uh, it's really a privilege, a privilege to sort of uh, get into you know into this space to sort of talk about some of the work that I've been doing with others. Um, I will say in advance that it is climate week. The excitement, you know, you probably feel the excitement this week in in New York City. So I've been at climate week events all day, and then I have to go back uh, out into the world into climate week uh, soon after my comments. So I apologize in advance. I'm gonna be one of those guys who like will creep out the door. Uh, so I apologize. I, I would really like to hear uh, more of the discussion, but again, it's you know, lots of things going on. What I'm gonna talk a little bit is sort of setting the stage, right? For some of the issues. Um, and now if I can remember. Behind the scenes, you know, okay. Well, I'll stay with the next slide. But, uh, <laughs> it will say the global picture. There it is. One more. So these are two um, uh, graphs that came out of some of the I guess, in the uh, and they're really sort of iconic of like, where we are. And the one on the left basically tells us uh, the, the rate of, of warming that we're experiencing. The baseline period that we're looking at is basically from 1860 to 1880. And we have about 1.1 plus degrees Celsius warming since that, that, that time frame. Um, and, you know, we can so, the, so that's the observed record. You can see that sort of like spike at the end of this graph. I think the, the important thing is, of course, if we look back, you know, in geologic time, we've had higher rates uh, or higher temperatures. Um, but the critical thing is the rate of change that we're experiencing right now is unprecedented. So that's sort of like the key, the key element. Um, the one on the uh, uh, the right, and again, I don't want to go too much into this because I assume that you've seen these graphs and know about them. The crucial thing that the this the report um, kind of enabled is this sort of understanding through modeling like what would the climate look like without the human um, uh, or anthropogenic signal of CO2 equivalent emissions over that last 140 years. Um, so if you took that out, what would the, the temperature look like? And that's the bottom part of that graph on the right. And then the observed is, is sort of, you can see it tracking along with the model projections. So you can see very clearly this human signal uh, in this uh, change in the temperature. Next, please. 
This is again tons of maps, tons of data, and I, I don't want to go through it belabor it too much. But one of the benchmarks we've been talking about, you know, is this idea of 1.5 degrees C. And this is sort of illustrative of a certain um, uh, you know, value of, of warming that we're going to be experiencing, uh, most likely getting to sometime in the mid part of the next decade, uh, a decade from now, right? So maybe maybe in a decade from, from today or 2033, somewhere in that, that time frame. And what we know um, from the science is that additional types of impacts, we've obviously you know, experienced a variety of impacts in climate change this summer. Um, and again, I don't want to get too much into the, some of the details, but we see signals of climate change in some of these events. Doesn't mean they're all caused by climate change, but we see the sort of the additional signals that come from climate change in these events. And so we, if we look at this graph from left to right, Everything kind of gets a little darker, you know, a little bit, you know, redder or a little bit um, there's more darker um, blue and so forth. That that shows increasing uh, shift, you know, climatic shift in the direct temperatures, the higher, higher uh, the higher sort of um, regional temperatures that you would be experiencing. And these are different scenarios. So right now we're sort of tracking sort of beyond two degrees C um, in terms of uh, warming. We will most likely the general consensus among the scientific community is we will overshoot 1.5, and you know we probably potentially overshoot two uh, given current trajectory. And so we can see some of the implications of that in terms of some of the modeling results moving forward. Next, please. So let's look uh, next week. So there's also been a lot of work. I was also was the co-chair of the University of Panel Climate Change. I'm no longer the co-chair, so I, I can I can I'm somewhat unburdened by that position. I felt like what I would really think. But um, they've been developing some new models, some new um, you know data on what the future might look like. And this is some of the, the new data yeah. that's coming out. Um, and basically, what you want to look at is along the left column here are the decadal slices for which the data are available. And then uh, produced for the city of New York is that central tendency between all the distributions and all the models um, that, that uh, the data in the parenthetical phrase is that central tendency between 70, 25th and 75th percentile, and then the extremes, like those, those scenarios for a lot of warming with you know, only 10% and then the, the higher end. And what we see if you tele telescope from the top to the bottom here, of course, the numbers get bigger. Um, and you know, we some of this is already sort of observed. Um, you know, in the climate record, we know that we have some anthropogenic warming already in, in the climate record for the city of New York, and that signal will increase over time. Um, and uh, the, I apologize, actually, in the more updated version of this, I, I kind of bracketed things. But one of the other things that they've been trying to look at is what the implications might be for particular extreme events, right? And I think, um, actually, if I, I glossed over the previous slide, okay, uh, we do see increasing warming. Uh, precipitation is a much more complicated picture, but the bottom line, there's a recognition of greater hydrologic variability, you know, through the model number, which means potentially uh, and most likely more droughty situations as well as more intense rainy periods as well, which is what we started to be seeing sort of uh, climatically in the city and other regions as well. So this data now looks at the top is uh, uh, slices of, uh, from the 2050s and then slices from the, the 2080s. I can go more into details of how, how this was sort of uh, computated, but the bottom line is if you compare the two, of course, we see the baseline, which is the leftmost column, you know, the numbers are, are concurrent. So 17, 4, 70, as you kind of uh, go down through the line, the things that we might want to kind of key in on are the days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're not dealing in Celsius anymore, both in the 2050s and the 2080s. And we kind of you toggle from left to right, um, you see those numbers start to pop up in the 2050s and the 2080s. So the bottom line is this sort of increasing, you know, temperature um, and, you know, particularly above 90 degrees, which is general the threshold the city of New York and many other cities in the region use as the baseline for heat wave. When you have three days above 90 degrees, it's not a scientific measure, it's sort of a convention. Three days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that becomes a heat wave. Right, um, and so you can see, you know, some of the forecasted sort of um, increases um, in these temperatures. Uh, correspondingly, we see a, a drop in the in some of those colder days. Uh, of course, there's you know tremendous amounts of implications um, for all of that. And the other thing I would say very specifically is that it's much easier to model temperature and potential for uh, temperature increases. Much more difficult to model precipitation 
But what this is trying to sort of illustrate for us, again, looking at the top slide, the part of the top of the slide and the bottom of the slide, it is those days um, with more than one inch of rain, more than two inches of rain, and more than um, uh, uh, four inches of rain. Recognize, and, and this starts to get into sort of the interstices of like you, you know, the built environment, like the, this, the, how, how large are the storm grades, you know, how are they designed? Do we have to start to think about retrofitting, um, you know, some of the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure to handle large runoffs? We see this, you know, even this past summer, these uh, described as colluvial uh, flooding events. We saw it up in Orange County. We've seen it in other cases. Um, uh, some, to some extent, Hurricane Ida in 2021 had that sort of flavor of a large rain event over a, short, a very short uh, period of time, really um, overwhelming the uh, uh, water infrastructure of, of the region. And of course, the heat waves as well, um, you know, increasing again, if you, you toggle from left to right, this was this past summer, although, you know, it was sort of moderate and, you know, to... It wasn't that we didn't have too many uh, hot days in general, it, uh, but it was still uh, warmer than normal. But you know, as we look back, um, uh, you know, and toggle from left to right in this slide, uh, of course, you'll see increased numbers of, um, of heat waves, et cetera, uh, becoming uh, part of the landscape of the city of New York. Next, um, this is another one that's very tricky: this idea of sea level rise. So sea level rise. There is a baseline of sea level rise that's already present in the region. I mean, not to get too much into the uh, historical uh, geology of the, of the region, we know that there was glaciers here uh, and here to the north that sort of suppressed the land surface. Those glaciers are gone. So there is some isostatic rebound. So we're kind of thinking about a seesaw method. So some of the sea level rise that we're seeing in the region is part of that isostatic rebound. We're also seeing sea level rise because of thermal expansion, warming of the upper layers of the water, as well as um, uh, glacial melts, you know, the uh, polar caps and so forth. And what we start to sort of see, again, similarly, if you go from uh, top to bottom, uh, in this case, going out to uh, 2150, so more than 100 years, and then extending uh, from left to right, um, you know, these different percentiles. Uh, and they've even started to calculate um, uh, <coughs> rapid ice melt and the implications that might have for sea level. The bottom line is that this becomes an issue with respect to uh, flooding during extreme events because the baseline is already higher. So if you have a category, if you have a hurricane sandy type storm in 20 years or 30 years, there's going to be more flooding just from that same extent because the sea level will be a little bit higher. Um, but the other the issue becomes if you live in lower Brooklyn or parts of Queens or even some parts of Manhattan that are very low elevation, you're going to get tidal flooding. You know, mean, a mean monthly high tide uh, tidal flooding, water in the streets. So these are sort of, and we're already starting to see a little bit of that in places like Howard Beach and Old Howard Beach, you know, to make it better. So we start to see signals of climate change already kind of connecting. Okay, next. So that sounds like a downer, sounds rough, sounds difficult. The bottom line is the international community and the city of New York has recognized, yes, there's a challenge, but also the cities are this great opportunity for responding to climate change, right? So globally, it's clear that the urbanization process is part of the solution. So if we go to the next slide. So these are some of the emission scenarios that we see uh, going on again from left to right out to 2100. The top lines are these sort of higher end scenarios of emissions that we're, that we're not actually tracking on at, at this particular moment. We're sort of, if you see the numbers, SSP, so talk between SSP and SS3 is sort of like the quote unquote current trend, um, maybe more toward the SSP2, um, uh, so 4.5 uh, degrees C increase. Um, I'm sorry, not that. No, it's a. I've got the other unit here, but it's, it's not. It's not green increase. But um, the SSP two uh, is sort of more. Uh, so it's sort of uh, some gradual increase to 2050, and then and then a decline in, in the emission. Now, why am I showing this graph? More than half the world's population lives in cities. About 54 percent. All of the population growth that we'll see uh, through the mid-century, uh, this mid-century, mid is going to be in cities, small and medium size, and low and moderate income. But even in the city of New York as well. Um, and that that population, even today, is responsible for about 70% of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that cities can do a lot to reduce their, their carbon footprint, which is sort of the, the nature of some of the conversation that we're engaging in here. So go to the next slide. One of the big things that IPCC was looking at, and 
promoting is not only this notion of adaptation, not only the idea of mitigating and reducing carbon emissions, but really connecting them to in the context of development and particularly development that's sustainable um, and uh, is uh, provides um, uh, you know justice, climate justice for all. And that the bucket that we've been describing here is climate resilient development. And if we can go just through a couple of these slides, um, you know, so it's quite clear this is IPCC result that you know cities provide this great opportunity for innovation, for hands-on experimentation. Um, you know, they sort of simultaneously you can see some of these co-benefits playing out, some of the trade-offs. So this is like you know part of the work that you all are doing, part of the discussion here this evening is really you know very much connected to the international community. Next, please. Uh, this is going to be a few toggles down. I really apologize. Just keep, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say what this is going to be. Um, basically, it's sort of talking about this notion of the cities become this great um, site of experiment. You can sort of toggle through all this. So, effective, you know, effective places of linking adaptation and mitigation um, and sort of sustainability for all across a range of different sort of domains nature based solutions, um, you know, infrastructure redevelopment. Uh, you know, capital reinvestment, urban agriculture. You can keep on going if you like. I apologize. So, one more, I think. Yes, safety nets, uh, uh, public health improvements. So, there's a lot going on in cities internationally as well as uh, domestically, and particularly in the city of New York. Thank you. Um, and this is going to be, a, I apologize. New York, uh, uh, I know, I'm like, I'm the neck, right? Uh, keep on going, keep on going. <laughs> We even doing. We all want to hide. Okay, that's good. Ah, we go. Go back. There you go. Okay. So, how do we do this? What are the ways? This is again from the IPCC. Some of the things we've talked about: political commitment and follow through across all levels of government. We're seeing examples of that, like this week in the discussions that we're having in the city, but also little in the city of New York itself in terms of the legislation. Um, in a institutional framework defining clear goals, priorities that define responsibilities. Again, the legislative you know domain is a really uh, a very aggressive place where this kind of work can be done. Enhancing knowledge of impacts and risks and improved responses, but getting that communication out, you know, being transparent with respect to what the risks are as well as some of the benefits. Monitoring and about and evaluation, absolutely key. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of new initiatives, but how do we know if they're working? How, how can we sort of translate these, these positive stories to others? And the last thing I'll say um, is that all this is predicated, all this activity has to be, you know, <laughs> well, not going to be successful. Comprehensive assessment of the, of the literature showed that over and over and over again. So equity and, and justice really have to be brought forward. And next, um, and I want to thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Sorecki. I think that's a really nice introduction for what we'll be talking about, which is the uh, Zero Emissions Vehicle for New York City Act, or ZEV for New York City Act. Um, I mentioned my name is Wayne Arden. I am the vice chair of the Sierra Club Group in New York City, and I'd like to introduce our panel. To, uh, my, to stage right of me is uh, Keith Powers, New York City uh, Majority Leader, he represents District 4, which is quite a large district, going from 14th in the south, I believe, up to 98th Street. Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. And it's very appropriate that he is here today. He is the prime sponsor of this bill and also a CUNY grad. And this very building is in his district. So I graduated from this building. <laughs> what could be better than that? That's fantastic. Uh, then Sam Wilson, Senior Analyst, Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, Frank Rieg, Rebel founder and CEO. Uh, CUNY's Kendra Kruger. Um, Professor Kruger is co-founder of Community Sensor Lab, STEM Education and Outreach Manager at CUNY ASRC. That's the Advanced Scientific Research Center. And then uh, Daniel Firth, who's Director of Climate Action Implementation, C40 Cities. And we're sitting in kind of a temporal order. So, um, the, those of us, the first four of us have been working on the bill. So we have a very much of a present perspective of the bill, but uh, Kendra and Daniel in particular, I think can offer us some insights about how do we leverage it in the future. So uh, what has, uh, I think 
Professor Selecki outlined, outlined the challenge. Uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius seems uh, very hard to attain. Two degrees Celsius is at, is at risk. What has New York City done to this point? New York City signed into law the Climate, Mo Climate Mobilization Act in 2019, which arguably is the world's most comprehensive legislation to address building emissions. But building emissions are not the only emissions. The second leading source is transportation. And there, New York City has not been as comprehensive in addressing transportation emissions, hence the need for action. And Majority Leader Powers introduced the ZEV, I'll, I'll say ZEV, it's just easier, uh, ZEV for New York City Act in April 22 to, to address this missing piece of the emissions puzzle. And there are really three salient arguments uh, in, in support of this bill, which we'll talk about. One is doing more to uh, combat climate change. The second is improving the respiratory health of New York City residents, especially in uh, EJ uh, communities. And the third is strengthening New York City's reputation as a business center of sustainability. Um, and now I should just perhaps describe uh, the bill very briefly uh, so you have a sense for what it is. I'll, uh, for the moment, I'll describe the current public version of the bill, although that, that I could say that that can change uh, as legislation is, is introduced. So the gist of the bill is this, it requires New York City to deploy a fully zero emissions vehicle fleet by July the 1st, 2035. Uh, that affects all of the classes of vehicles that New York City has, light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty vehicles. And then there are two purchasing deadlines, one in 2025 for light duty and medium duty vehicles where New York City needs to start purchasing those vehicles and one in 2030 for heavy duty vehicles. There's a very limited exceptions for the city to buy the sort of the next least polluting vehicles if for some reason due to a high price or a um, perhaps a duty cycle that doesn't quite match, uh, the, the zero emissions vehicle option doesn't work. That is the gist of the bill, but uh, I was going to ask Majority Leader Powers, where are we, but... I don't know where we are. Uh, first of all, nice to see everyone, and thank you, thank you, Wayne, and thank you for all the panels here. And um, I, I'll tell you where we're at, but I want to just say something before that, which is, I think as elected officials, I think as... Um, folks in a major city, in a major market, uh, we often underappreciate how much of a market mover or how much of an impact we can have. And uh, you will see, and I'll leave it to some others who maybe know this better than I do, but I think you will see often when states like California and New York, to get, especially together, move on a particular, I was just about this the other day on a different issue, um, you can really have a, a sincere impact. And we know that cities borrow from each other and look at each other. And um, sometimes don't question whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but sometimes say, well, Chicago did it, New York did it, whatever, and we see legislation and things like that that follow. So what we actually were coming from was um, we have heard now the former Mayor de Blasio and even this current mayor, Eric Adams, talk about moving our city fleet, usually trying to Earth Day, sometime around there, talk about, or Climate Week, you know, um, make some announcement around moving our fleet into uh, all electric. And I think something that we said, it was said earlier, what resonates, which is you can make announcements, but often there's not the political commitment or follow-up. It gets worse when you have um, term limits. I'm out in two years. Uh, the mayor is out in six years. You know, it's like you know there is guaranteed turnover and term limits, so there's not often the folks to stick around and make sure those things happen as well. That's why you see mayors make the same announcement or something like it all over again to to kind of get their uh, thing. So we we put a, the legislation in to say that when I am sitting on a beach somewhere, hopefully in early retirement, that I will know that this is actually the law of New York City. It's not an announcement that's got to be sitting on another mayor's desk anywhere. So we introduced legislation last year to hold um, the city accountable for that and to speed up the timeline of it. And it has taken a long time because we have had a number of conversations. And I want to say thank you to Sierra Club because you guys have been the leads in the city environmentally pushing to get this bill done. And I've added a lot of ur urgency and emphasis to that and made sure it wasn't just a bill sitting somewhere. It was a priority. So I want to give you guys a lot of credit. And second is 
the other last piece of this was as we evolve and we move into new endeavors here around climate, you know, how to combat climate change. We are also also want to make sure we think about the workforce here. And the last piece of this has been ensuring that as we move forward, we also think about the city workforce, how to maintain, retain, improve, expand jobs around that. And that's been actually really one of the most like sort of last pieces we've been working on for a long time is what is in the cities and state power to, you know, train, retain and all the sort of things around the workforce as well. So we have been trying for some time to kind of finally land the plan on this. An hour ago, we got a deal on it. We are going to pass it. We're going to pass it in two weeks, a week, one week uh, at our next city council meeting. I am not kidding you. This came together today. It has been a long time coming and we have a deal with labor, Sierra Club, Keith Bowers, and city council and we are going to pass it and that's very very exciting and big news and you deserve my friend a big round of applause for that um it is very exciting the timing this is our this is this is the day in the city council where we literally put bills on the desks and say we're passing them it's tonight at midnight so this was all just fortuitous that this timing worked out this was not like a political stunt uh <laughs> I wish I was that smooth, uh, but this is really good news. We're going to do it. We're going to pass it. We expect it to go into law, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to that. And I, before, I want to thank Wayne, and I want to thank Haley in my office, who has lost years on her life trying to get this <laughs> over the finish line. But that's really good news. And I know Frank will talk about the for hire industry and everything that's going on there. That's another big piece of it alongside the city fleet. But um, that is some very good news, and we're very excited about it. Fabulous. <laughs> And by the way, he found out when I told him when I walked in the room today. I held I held it for a moment until just now. It's been it's been a long time coming, and it's so exciting. And now we need to talk about how do we build on this. Um, one of the questions for you just relates to the summer, and I spent the summer and and almost all the summer in New York City. The World Meteorological Organization published a report. We just lived through the hottest three week period in a hundred thousand years. I mean, it's it's stunning. When you talk to your constituents. How, how are they reacting to climate change versus all of the other challenges of living in New York City, like uh, affordable housing and health care and crime and all, all of the other things that, that, that we worry about? Well, number one is, and I have to apologize because I am actually speaking on a panel. It's set in a little bit on zero. Well, we did a zero waste. I did a zero waste package earlier this year, too, which we're going to be speaking on. It's a very busy day. Um, uh, look, there, a lot of these issues are interrelated for what it's worth, and you can find some sort of commonality in them. I, I think a lot of folks understand and um to want to live in a city that is, you know, standing up for our, our environmental goals, you know, providing leadership when it comes to climate change. When you talk about certain laws like Local 97, we do see challenges though when you get to implementation of it, which is you do have to ask people to make a big sacrifice, a financial uh, contribution to improve their building, and it gets actually pretty challenging. And so it's always important to have the political support and allies. It is important to figure out where there's a you know, sort of crossover between it. It is, it is, it is important to lead by example, it's like where we have authority in our own, uh, in our own, and, or working with stakeholders and partners to actually do that ourselves. So we're lead first. But the, I think it, I think it rings high on people's minds, and certainly it's a, it's a issue that has, I think, a lot of, a lot of um, attention and popularity, in, you know, in the city. But I think what we find is it's hard. There's a certain point in time where it gets really hard politically, and you have to kind of overcome these political hurdles because it is going like all things is going to challenge people or cost or require sacrifice or something like that. And I think that's the biggest goal we have in all, all of this conversation is how, asking people to make sacrifices on behalf of the long term goal and politics reward short-term goals over long-term goals doesn't build a lot of political capacity, especially in a term-limited world for that. So that's where people here and you and others come in, which is like, uh, I'm not joking about, it. I'm like, I am, I'm term-limited, I'm out. So like, we need people to continue to run on it, to provide candidates support for when they run, to be building this into their agenda, and to talk about it, issues where we talk about like the issues you mentioned, where do they cross over and how do you connect to voters talking about how they relate to each other or other issues that people really care about and I, well, one thing i'd add is there is definitely a growing movement around certain issues we are doing we did this year waste package like i cannot tell you how many people in my neighborhood stopped me on the street to talk about composting with me i do not think that was the case a couple of years ago so i think there's some energy around some of these issues and people kind of 
in the urban environment get to get to get more acquainted with them. Well, that's really positive news because there's so much work to be done. Um, Sam, and, until recently, one could say that California has led in emissions re relate, related legislation. How does this bill, which we now know is, know is poised to be passed, so it will be voted on next week, and I should say that there are 40 council members that are co-sponsors of the bill, so it, it has very strong support in the New York City Council. But how does this legislation compare with what California has done? And, and Sam's an expert in, in what California has done. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Wayne. Uh, hey, everybody, Sam Wilson with Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, just to let everybody know, I'm probably just going to be speaking to the heavy-duty vehicle parts of this. Um, that, that's what I focus on uh, uh, with UCS. Um, so I think most people in the room are probably familiar with the Advanced Clean Cars 2 rule that, that um, California passed a few months ago. Um, requiring 100% sales of light duty vehicles by 2032, I think. Um, in April, we also passed a, a hugely significant rule um, that is uh, very similar to um, uh, 0279, or the, what are they calling it, the ZEV bill? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. ZEV bill. Um, yeah, so uh, that this, uh, this rule is called the Advanced Clean Fleets Rule, and it requires two major things. First, um, we are uh, 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 banning the sale of uh, uh, combustion-fueled heavy-duty vehicles in California post-2036. We're also, and this is, I believe, the first um, regulation of, in the world to be passed like this, uh, re requiring the largest fleets to actually begin transitioning uh, their uh, uh, heavy-duty commercial vehicles, so from from your delivery vehicles all the way up to uh, tractor trailer trucks. Uh, they're gonna start transitioning uh, January 1st of 2024, so in a couple of months. And uh, uh, it requires a full transition of the vast majority of the Californian economy to zero emissions in 2042, so it's pretty huge. One of the things that really sparked my interest about um, the ZEV bill was that it moved uh, significantly faster than ACF, so I wanna thank you for your leadership on that. Um, uh, they're both, um, both of the, both the ACF in California and the ZEV bill here require vehicle turnover. And that is huge because, um, heavy duty vehicles can stay on the road for, uh, 13 to 20 years, depending on what it's doing. And so, um, uh, it, it's, it's really huge. And the last thing I'd like to say about that is, you know, we, in terms of climate, we, we tend to focus on, um, on light duty vehicles a lot. And I think that that's, that, that, that's the correct focus. But um, when we're looking at uh, the types of vehicles that are on our roads, uh, heavy duty vehicles are just about 10% of the vehicles on our roads and highways, but they're responsible for a hugely disproportionate impact uh, to both uh, really to the air quality, but climate change too. So 10% of the vehicles on the road are commercial heavy duty vehicles. They're responsible for, in some cases, in some states, over 50% of fine particulate emissions and nitrogen oxides, which are precursors to ozone. Um, so addressing uh, that pollution and electrifying these vehicles is going to be a huge win. So in summary, New York and California are kind of neck and neck. In some ways, this bill is ahead. In some ways, it's... Yeah, I think you guys got us on this one. OK, <laughs> that's good to hear. Um, Frank, so... A total of 13 uh, advocacy groups supported this bill, but also five New York City companies headquartered in New York City, including Revel. And Revel is, I think we New Yorkers uh, are very familiar with Revel. We see the cars everywhere. Um, you probably have the most visible brand of all of these five companies. Um, talk about why, and, and, and Revel testified at the hearing in December, so has been very proactive in supporting the bill. Um, why did Revel decide to support the uh, Sub for New York City Act? Yeah, thanks, Wayne. I appreciate you inviting me here tonight. Um, the council member mentioned sometimes when you have forward-looking legislation, some of the issues prop, pop up in terms of implementing it. Um, and when it comes to 30,000 light-duty vehicles owned by the city of New York going electric, um, or the recent announcement from the Taxi Limousine Commission and the mayor's office where all 100,000 rideshare vehicles need to go electric by 2030, when you talk about implementing these things, then you have to talk about access to fast charging infrastructure. That is just the bottom line or else it's not really going to happen. Um, and the reason why is the chicken or egg problem, right? It's very expensive to put fast charging infrastructure in a city like New York. It's the reason why there's really none outside of Revel. Um, and if you're gonna 
put up all that capital, put fast charging in a city like New York, it better be utilized a lot or else there's no way you're going to make money and the business case doesn't make sense. And who wants an EV in the city if there's not access to public fast charging everywhere? So here we are, we have the chicken or egg problem. I like to say the EV transition in cities in the US is basically stuck in neutral right now, right? Um, so what Revel's trying to do is we're bringing an integrated strategy to this where we are building a dense network of fast charging infrastructure in New York City. Uh, we have about 55 fast charging plugs live today uh, with a pipeline of uh, about 400 plus in the next 18 months, which would be over 90% market share in New York, just to give you an idea of how much we're building. And we're building all that infrastructure to use primarily for our rideshare fleet, but everything will be publicly available. So we started with 50 blue EVs. Today I'm sitting here, we have 550. And obviously we're gonna to continue to scale that fleet. And that charging infrastructure we're putting in the ground is powering that fleet. And the rides we're selling to New Yorkers, to the airports and everything else allows us to build that charging infrastructure and to have an economic case for it. But everything we're building is publicly available. Um, so that's gonna allow folks like the city of New York, when they do electrify 30,000 light duty vehicles, they're gonna need places to charge. They're going to need reliable, accessible spots throughout the city. And Revel can hopefully help in a big way to charge that fleet. When you think about 30,000 vehicles, you have to put that into perspective. Last time I checked EV registrations in the city of New York, 30,000 is more than the total amount of EV registrations for private citizens in New York. So just gives you an idea. You electrify 30,000 vehicles, is a big deal. You electrify 100,000 rideshare vehicles, that's a big deal as well. Green Rides Initiative. Just go outside yourself. Look at license plates of cars that go by you. If they start with T and end in C, that's an Uber or Lyft vehicle. Obviously, if it's a blue one, it's a Revel. There's a lot of those in Manhattan. So imagine if all of that's electrified. Anyway, uh, I'll stop talking, but it's it's all really exciting stuff. Uh, just to put a number on it, the, in the US, approximately 80% of the economy is driven by the private sector. So I don't know how we can tackle climate change without embracing and involving the private sector. So it's terrific that Revel has stepped up. Um, Kendra, there was so uh, in talking in advance of the panel, we discussed a, a really exciting study that the medical school at USC uh, made public earlier this year, I believe in February. And what that study found is that um, the adoption of zero emission vehicles uh, or EVs in general, that category includes plug-in hybrids has been so significant in California that California is seeing health-related benefits. So the number is for every 20 CEVs per thousand people in a specific zip code, there was a 3.2% drop in the related asthma-related emergency visits to hospitals. So you are pioneering a, a fantastic program with sensors uh, with that your students are, are helping to program around the city to measure pollution. Talk us a little bit about that work and how perhaps that work could, could relate to the bill now that we know the bill will pass and we're gonna to have to start to think about how do we measure the, uh, the effect of the bill. Yeah, it's gonna be super important to track the effects of, of what it's gonna look like, the impacts on air quality. And CUNY is super interested in being part of this research and tracking things on air quality and also the health effects. And I think what's really important, the approach that CUNY wants to take is how do we do this research with and at service to the community so that community members are, are not only informing the research that's happening, but also participating in the research. So we're looking at, there's many different participatory research programs that are starting to form and coalitions that are forming with a lot of grassroots organizations. So for example, there is a really great launch just yesterday uh, here at the Graduate Center, we launched the Climate Justice Hub, which is gonna be a great uh, partnership between CUNY and New York Environmental Justice Alliance, which is a collection of different um, grassroots community organizations across New York City that is going to allow for a lot more of these conversations to happen with community members to really see like what 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 is the most of the most most concern like obviously we want more data on this but there also needs to be more literacy more research more resources connected um, and as we're seeing in those conversations there is much more awareness about air quality and the effects of uh, of what's causing bad air quality and health effects. And the program that I run called the Community Sensor Lab, we held a uh, community listening sessions where we wanted to know, we, were, we had this, this 
technology of building low cost sensors with Arduinos. So similar platform of, you know, making robotics sort of things, but using those to actually um, do different types of environmental monitoring. So we could have done a, a number of different monitoring, went to communities where like, what do you want to know? And we ended up forming quite a strong relationship with a community in Red Hook, Brooklyn, because they're very concerned about uh, the increased traffic that's gonna be possible with an Amazon last mile warehouse facility that's being built in that neighborhood. So we're like, okay, let's, let's go, let's figure out how to build these kind of air quality sensors. And so for the past two years, we've actually been training community members in our lab at the Advanced Science Research Center in, in tech, envi environmental technology, basically understanding like deeper how the sensing technology works, having more literacy around this technology and understanding data as well. So that as we see these changes that are happening, how can we measure, how can we say, like see in certain communities that have been most impacted by uh, poor air quality or other environmental factors, that some of these changes are going to be making differences, and we can use that data to then go back, you know, and and tell the story to say how can we do more now? Like, what's the next step of that? Um, so there's other there's lots of great other coalitions happening. We're partnering with Mount Sinai to do more of the connections with air quality, public health data. Um, we've got a great atmospheric research uh, observatory on the roof. The Advanced Science Research Center is up on the city south end of the City College campus in Harlem. And we've kind of got a great vantage point there of monitoring air quality in Harlem and in the South Bronx, where historically there's also been, um, they've been, been disproportionately affected by many climate crises. So I think just looking into how, how can we start monitoring things, these things, um, and what are the effects of, of, of pol these policy changes going to have, and how can we start to communicate that and um, have more conversation so that everybody's sort of involved in those um, discussions and that information. That's a terrific that you're interacting with Mount Sinai. It's really important, I think, to get the medical community involved as well. And just an interjection, I um, uh, two years ago, I spoke to a prominent physician at one of the major systems. And one of the problems that uh, her hospital suffers from is from diesel ambulances that idle outside of operating rooms and those fumes drift into the operating room because the operating room has to be, the emergency operating room has to be very close to the entrance. And those fumes drift in and affect the quality of the air. So it's a completely unexpected problem that zero emission vehicles will help um, resolve. So C40 Cities, Daniel, not everyone in our audience perhaps uh, knows the organization um, and play a, a critical role internationally. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about C40 Cities and, um, now we know the bill will indeed uh, be signed into law. Um, how will it affect other cities? And you work with quite a network of cities. Sure. So um, C40 Cities, for people who don't know, it's a network of about 100, um, not quite the world's largest, but we like to say the world's greatest cities who are coming together to work on climate change. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it's um, really trying to bring together mayors at a political level uh, to work together, to um, to share ideas, to steal ideas, to borrow ideas, uh, also to compete a little bit between each other to try and prove that they are the best. You know, we're, we're doing the most advanced policies. We're moving faster than you are to, you know, don't underestimate that as a, a, as a, a driver of uh, mayors and politicians more generally. Um, and I think the, the, the excitement or the interest in this bill or the, the, any of these kinds of policies is it's it, it kind of speaks directly to C40's theory of change. We will support uh, mayors and politicians and cities to introduce the most ambitious policies they can. Uh, we will work with them to build coalitions, uh, support them to build the coalitions that are needed. And the, I think the coalition here is a really interesting example. And I think it would be make a really great case study for, for other cities to look at. Um, make sure that we are working together with uh, teams like Kendra's to bring the um, the evidence that shows that these uh, um, uh, these policies are effective, and then uh, kind of use that to spread best practice as much as we can to bring city officials together, to bring elected officials and, and, and city officers together, compare what works, but also compare what doesn't work, right? Because you almost learn more from uh, some of the war stories that we bring our, our city officials together and talk about, and also talk about how difficult this stuff is. This is not easy. The council member had to leave, but um, 
I'm sure this has been a, we've heard just from the amount of time it's taken. These are difficult things to do, to reach consensus on, to get right, to do it in a way that's bringing people with us, that's that, that's uh, um, uh, going to, to, to lead to a just transition that isn't leaving people behind. That, you know, if we're talking about medium and heavy duty vehicles in particular is not damaging small businesses, is not uh, only promoting the interests of, of, of bigger businesses and bigger um, organizations. So I think there's a lot of uh, um, cities that we're working with, both in the US and all over the globe, because we're a, a global organization, who've got their eyes on New York for all kinds of reasons, but I think particularly for this this particular bill and other things that are are surrounding it, they won't be able to implement it in exactly the same way. You know, all politics is local and all governance is very local. I'm learning very quickly that uh, the governance systems of these 97 cities we were, we're working with are all completely unique in their own way. Um, so they'll 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 take what they can and, and apply it in the way that they can. But the basic uh, lessons of this is an important thing to do. It's going to be effective. These are some of the tools you need to use in order to uh, to make sure you're bringing people along with you and that uh, you can pass this uh, complex and undoubtedly controversial in some ways legislation. So we uh, go New York is what I say. We're uh, <clears throat> we're all watching you. Great to have uh, have our allies cheering us on. So, um, a quick question about technology here, um, and I think the three of you especially focus on technology. Uh, very mentioned vehicles are uh, have a lot of benefits. They have seventy to ninety percent, depending how you count, fewer moving parts, so maintenance is a lot expensive. This is uh, something New York City itself has noted. Uh, electricity is one half to one third the price, depending on where you are, of gasoline or diesel. But uh, historically, the initial purchase price has been higher than comparable internal combustion engine vehicles. But we're getting close in light duty vehicles. And, and if you need the order of things, we'll reach parity with light duty vehicles first, then medium duty, then eventually we hope heavy duty. Um, Sam, maybe starting with you, how do you, how do you perceive these, trend, these trends uh, uh, progressing? Yeah, yeah. So, um... You know the the issue of price parity is is uh, is exacerbated even further in terms of heavy duty vehicles. I mean, we can see um, uh, you know a, a comparable uh, class eight tractor truck costing two or three times the amount of its uh, combustion counterpart, usually a diesel. Um, but with as as model availability is growing, we're also seeing um, uh, good news in terms of price parity. Um, you know, we think about five years ago or 10 years ago, I mean, the, the conversation around heavy duty vehicles was largely, you know, how can we increase efficiency to reduce um, uh, emissions? And now we have the technology to actually electrify these vehicles and happy to report um, that uh, there are fleets in California, particularly Pepsi in Sacramento is running a fleet of uh, Tesla semis right now, and they're doing a fully laden uh, 400 mile day runs uh, on a single charge in these Tesla semis over the mountain range uh, to Reno from from Sacramento. So uh, huge advances. But to directly answer your question there, um, uh, the research is showing pretty much across the board that we will reach total cost parity. Um, so considering maintenance, fuel, uh, repair, et cetera, um, among all classes of heavy duty vehicles by the end of the decade, which is huge. Um, it's particularly huge for um, uh, for class A tractor trucks, which play an outsized role in uh, uh, PM and uh, NOx pollutions, especially in disproportionately impacted communities and port side communities. Now, New York City doesn't have many class eight trucks, so that should happen earlier to New York City than right uh, than a class eight truck. Yeah, Frank, these trends of technology advancement, especially in battery technologies, is, is core to your business model. What what are you experiencing, and and what do you anticipate? So, I mean, in terms of vehicle pricing, we're seeing that pricing coming down, and I think we all sort of agree that it will continue to come down. Um, we also work with financing partners that continuing, they are continuing to get more comfortable financing electric vehicles. Um, cause if you're a, you know, debt provider for fleets, you don't like to take risk. You like to know exactly what that vehicle is worth X year, X miles. And no one quite knew that with electric vehicles, even when we first started right here in 2021. Now folks are starting to get more secure, just feel better about battery degradation meaning they're not degrading as much as people thought. 
So the sort of vehicle life is longer. So just like financing is becoming more and more available, I am seeing it, just folks that I talk to you know, weekly. Um, I think the other piece though of technology, it all goes back to none of this happens without charging and access. It just doesn't. And I think something we probably need to be screaming from the rooftops more is the grid is an issue. Um, the biggest impediment to a company like us building fast charging, and just to make sure we're on the same page, when we say fast charging, charging a car in 10 to 20 minutes, not 10 hours, right? True fast charging. Um, when you're working with PG&E or Con Edison, you're asking for a two, four, five megawatt upgrade. That's the amount of power this building uses. They're used to five-year development cycles to deliver you that power. How am I supposed to get a deal done with a landlord if I have to tell him or her, hey, can I get five years of free rent? Con Ed can't give me power for five years. Deal doesn't happen. Infrastructure doesn't get built. So I think if we're talking about transition of EVs, more EV adoption, we have to be talking about charging access. We have to be talking about the grid, especially in city environments, because the grid is so congested. There are entire neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods that if Revel goes to Con Edison and says, can we get a power grade? The answer is just no. You cannot because <laughs> the grid is so congested. So it's just something else I think to call out from the technology piece. Well, there's, there's work to do to achieve uh, the goals that we aspire to. Let's um, let's turn to businesses. The New York City can only pass laws that affect the vehicles that New York City itself uses. The laws that affect consumers and businesses are the purview of the federal government or states that choose to follow California's emissions laws and regulations. In uh, the Plan NYC document called Getting Sustainability Done 2023, the city called out idling offenders. And the top five are LabQ, Clinical Diagnostics, Amazon, Con Ed, Verizon, and Merchants Auto Group, which is a fleet management company. So how can, or how could the Zephyr New York City Act serve as an example how do we urge the private sector to move faster now that new york city um, will be doing this will be moving faster and just a word about amazon i find that that example discouraging um amazon issued a press release in december 2021 stating that two-thirds of its fleet in paris is comprised of zero emission vehicles and there's, it's nowhere near that in new york city but to be fair to Amazon, they have done some good things related to climate change. They they were co-founder of the Climate Pledge, which is a commitment to meet the Paris Agreement goals 10 years early. So maybe there's room there to, to nudge them to move faster. Um, just going down the line here, um, what are your thoughts? How do, how do using New York City now, moving faster to deploy zero emission vehicles, how can that affect businesses? Well, I think one of the uh, one of the great things about the Zev bill is um, is I believe it has bipartisan support, um, and I think it could be uh, something that is replicated uh, in other cities, particularly those in red you know blue states and red cities like Atlanta or or Miami. Um, uh, it's going to be different. Uh, you know, they, they don't reflect New York City in many ways, so it, it will be different. But um, uh, that's a huge thing about the bill. Uh, speaking to businesses, I mean, uh, New York uh, State and City and California are the only three uh, entities in the United States that I know of that offer uh, incentives to businesses that electrify. So incentives can be huge, uh, especially in the near term, the next decade. Um, while we're, um, uh, you know, just getting this market going. So that, that's that's the first thing, I think, incentives for, for purchases. Okay, um, that's something the city can build on. Uh, Kendra, uh, a question for you. Plan New York City stated, and I'll quote it, our reliance on diesel trucks disproportionately burdens low-income communities of color adjacent to the city's industrial areas which are now home to a growing concentration of last mile delivery facilities. You just referenced that in, in Red Hook. So what could CUNY do working with colleagues, other colleagues, other universities, colleagues via your program of measurement of emissions, academic studies, increased discussion, more transparency? Uh, what could be done to accelerate the transition and really uh, nudge the private sector to try to achieve the health benefits that California is beginning to experience? Yeah, and again, I think that uh, this 
is creating a good model to put more pressure on on those commercial industries. And if we are able to collect more data to see what the impacts of this reduction in emissions, it's an even greater uh, sense of proof to show like what could it be if we could reduce them even further. And I think with more of these community data collection practices that are evolving, we can get more of this hyper-local picture of how different communities are affected. And, and through more literacy programs as well uh, around uh, environmental science, around climate change, around uh, data collection, that we can get more of a diverse picture uh, that we can use for that communities can use for advocacy. So, so showing that this kind of uh, legislation and these kind of changes of municipal vehicles changing to EV, if we're able to do this hyperlocal data collection to see how that's being how different communities are affected by that, then there's more of a story to say. Now we want it to go even further. We want to. We've got the data that shows this. So let's put more pressure on the communities that are still seeing high levels of emissions and particulate matter, um, usually in these high congestion places that still have high congestion and are being affected by these heavy duty vehicles, you know, because as, as I already spoke about Red Hook, they were concerned about truck traffic, but there's also a lot of concern about construction and construction traffic. Um, and how can we, yeah, again, use that data to just put more pressure on, on these other organizations and businesses? Okay. Frank, can, can you share any stories of businesses that have reached out to Revel and said, um, how are you doing what you're doing? Where, where can we go where Revel is gone? In other words, they're, they, they, they're asking for your expertise and insight into accelerating charging infrastructure? Um. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, we have a pipeline of over 400 fast charging stalls that are designed and construction right now that'll go live in the next 18 months. Um, and that's spread out across the city. So for instance, we have zero fast charging stalls in the Bronx today as a city. Revel's putting over 50 there. We've already announced that across two sites. Uh, we've announced we're putting 60 stalls in Mass with Queens where the LIE meets the BQE, um, right where the Amazon warehouse is, the FedEx warehouse is, the USPS warehouse is. Um, we're putting 20 fast charging stalls in Red Hook, actually, a uh, partnership with NYSERDA. It's going to be the first bi-directional public fast charging site, I think in the U.S. Uh, so that was through a $7 million grant win from NYSERDA. It allows us to build something really unique in Red Hook for that community. Um, all of this to say is a lot of people are reaching out um, from the big companies to just recently, we had a small wholesale bakery. Uh, take a few spots at our original charging site in bed uh, to do delivery runs with. So now they have EVs to do their wholesale bakery runs with, um, with their medium duty vans. So everything from the big fortune 500s, I don't want to talk too much there to uh, the small bakery that is a deal that is signed and they're delivering bread with electric vehicles now. So it's kind of uh, the gamut. That's promising. Uh, Daniel, what's, what's your international experience cities that uh, have ambitious programs uh, similar to what New York City is trying to do and is trying to push, prod, persuade the private sector, especially the business community to follow suit. Yeah, a, a, a bunch of things to say about this, I think. So before I joined C40, I was Chief Strategy Officer for Transport at the City of Stockholm in Sweden. Um, Stockholm quite deliberately and quite early on uh, committed to making as much as it could of its own municipal fleet not necessarily zero emission, but low emission, taking the, the best technology we could available at the time. And part of that strategy was so that we could sit down and look businesses in the eye and say, we've done this. We can share our experience with you. I could bring my fleet manager to meet somebody else's fleet manager. We could talk about the, the challenges of it, the, the, the benefits. You know, we, we, we were showing we have skin in the game. And I think I've seen a number of cities do similar things as a way of kind of showing, we get it. We know this is hard. We're there alongside you. We're going to go a little bit in advance. We're going to make sure the charging infrastructure is there because we need it to. Um, we're going to share our war stories. So I think that there's a great benefit in in kind of leading with municipal vehicles and also buses. And we could talk a lot about um, the zero emission bus work we've been doing, but I'll I'll save that for maybe a future question or another another event. Um, you'd reference Paris, which I think is a really interesting example. Um, 
the, one of the reasons uh, Amazon in Paris and other operators in Paris have a, a large proportion of low emission or zero emission vehicles is because the city is mandating them. There is a zero emission or low emission uh, legislation in Paris. London is another fun, fantastic example of that. Um, our chair, Mayor Khan of London, he's in town today meeting with the United Nations. Um, and there he is talking about his um, ultra low emission zone. He very recently expanded the ULES ultra low emissions zone to cover all of Greater London. So population of about 10 million people. Um, we've met with uh, operators, last mile operators, including Amazon in London, who basically say to us, this is how the um, the business case for moving to zero emission vehicles was created because the mayor put in place legislation saying, if you don't comply with these uh, standards, we're going to charge you every day, £12.50, whatever that is in dollars, I don't know, but it's, it's a sizable amount of money if you're paying it every day, even if you are Amazon. Um, those kind that kind of legislation we're very aware is quite difficult in in US cities and we've been working with uh, a number of US cities and, and your colleagues at uh, CUNY to kind of work out um, what kind of legislation would be possible what kind of uh, um, uh, um, activity is possible it's not necessarily so that it's needed in the US and I think um, that this kind of legislation is much better done at a national level cities are doing what they can and often cities are leading with these kinds of uh, um, uh policies when their national government isn't isn't stepping up to the plate so kind of showing that not least showing manufacturers and operators that there is demand so we're working with cities on pretty much every continent so from rio to jakarta to uh, johannesburg to warsaw on these kinds of low emission zone policies that are really going to drive that kind of uh, um, activity i just want to say something else about amazon um or more uh, accurate the climate pledge which was founded by amazon um, we yesterday announced a partnership with the Climate Pledge. Uh, we are working with six cities in Latin America, four cities in India, again, to work out what can these cities do using the legislation they have, using the powers they have to try and persuade businesses and the businesses that the Climate Pledge is bringing together. You know, you've made this commitment. Now is the time to 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 show that you actually want to do those things. And we're going to lead with these uh, these 10 cities in, in India and Latin America. And that will be things like low emission zones in Rio, but it could also be things like scrappage schemes. Um, and in particular, the, the, the freight industry is really complex in every country, but it, it, in some of these countries is particularly difficult. It's um, often like uh, the, the companies that own most one or two vehicles. It's a, it's a person and a truck. How do we make sure we're bringing those people along? This uh, um, the transition can't only be a thing that Amazon can afford or that Anheuser Bush can afford. It's got to be small businesses have got to be able to be brought along. We've got to find business models that are going to work for them. Um, I was talking to someone in the audience about um, trucking as a service and how can we use those kinds of uh, policies. Then that's what we're going to try and explore together with uh, our partners at the Climate Pledge funded by Amazon. We can all have opinions about Amazon, but um, in this particular case, they're going to work with us to try and find some of the solutions. That's, uh, that's very good news. So it's urgent to uh, accelerate their efforts here in your city as well. <laughs> Um, for anyone on the panel, just quickly, I think we should say something about consumers because it's something that uh, we in New York City and New York State are are not so far advanced uh, with. If you look at the numbers uh, through June, um, per the California government, the market share of uh, electric vehicles, so this is both zero emission vehicles and uh, plug-in hybrids, was 24%. And if you compare that to the statistic for New York State, uh, New York State doesn't have a, a, a first half statistic for it. So for 2022, the number is 1.3%. Mm -hmm. So we in New York City, as part of New York State, have a long ways to go to convince consumers to embrace zero emission vehicles. For anyone in the panel, do you have any thoughts about this, this challenge? How do we accelerate efforts so that New York City and New York State can uh, get more consumers to participate in the market? Does anyone have a thought? <laughs> I mean, I I mentioned it twice already, but charging access. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to keep up, you know, stay up here and keep saying that. Um, why would somebody in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, where I live, get an EV? Where are you going to charge? Um, closest station would probably be Rebel Station, actually, in bed -Stuy, But even that is a couple of mile drive. So it's just really hard to say with a straight face. Consumers, you should get EVs in New York City when there is no access to public fast charging, because it makes it really difficult to own a vehicle. Is uh, Kendra, is there a role as a, uh, a leading uh, institution of higher learning that CUNY could play here, um, an awareness perhaps? It, or are you seeing, is it a generational thing? Do you find that students uh, 
Uh, I know this would be sort of an informal kind of poll, but do you find that students say, I'm only going to own a, a zero emission vehicle or is it, uh, what's your experience? Well, that, that's a tricky question to, for, to answer with most of the populations and communities that I work with that maybe are more using public transportation and not so much buyers of vehicles. Um, so I don't know. I, I think even maybe part of it is also conversations around like moving more to public transportation, let's say, like, and having, uh, having better services of public transportation so that it, um, that we can also serve like uh, a wider population of users and, and, and moving like this is a good legislation to move public transportation towards electric vehicle usage. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, I think that definitely younger generations of people are, um, are I don't know if we're going to talk more about this, but definitely much more concerned about uh, the effects uh, on the environment and making more choices in that way and thinking also just in general, like more, more about the social connections between technology and climate and our communities as well. Um. We're, we're a little past the time now, chapter seven. I wanted to uh, move to the sort of the concluding question, but a follow-up, which was part of another question. So to what extent are your students interested in working in sustainability? It's, uh, if you think about it, it's fascinating. It affects all disciplines of engineering. So uh, if you use a wind turbine as an example, it's aeronautical, mechanical, electrical, there's chemical, if there's a battery storage system nearby, um, you need uh, IT, computer science, uh, the, the program to run it. Uh, so there's enormous opportunities. Are, you, are your students uh, seeing that? And you've got a potential employer sitting next to you. <laughs> so so uh, Frank, what, what kind of skills are you looking for? So it's a, it's a dual question. <laughs> Mercy. Sure, I, uh, so I would say definitely from the students and even the community members that I work with in our educational programs are the most inspiring thing to me is that folks are thinking about things much more interdisciplinarily. And also from a place of, like I was saying, a, a place of like human connection, like people want to feel connected and a sense of purpose and a sense of morals in the work that they do, even in the STEM students uh, that I work with. You know, I, I came up through engineering degrees and I would say, when I was uh, doing my bachelor's and master's, there wasn't a lot of space for talk around like the social implications of technology. It was more like, well, that's not for us, that's for the social scientists to decide and figure out how this technology is gonna be used in the world. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that there's much more space and, and craving to do work for good and to do science and do technology for good. And in, and in ways that are gonna be healing for our world and like understanding the damage that technology has done in the past and figuring out ways that we can engage with that in more creative ways. So I think that that, that creativity and that interdisciplinary way of thinking and more holistic way of thinking is something that students want and are even looking for in jobs. You know, I think that even, you know, I would say a lot of CUNY students are very, um, are, are, are job driven, you know, many, many students are, are trying to support families and are first generation students and so forth. So that's important to them, but there's this conflict because they want to go into tech and business, but at the same time, they want to do something that's going to be serving their community and not kind of go into these, is these same sort of extractive companies that they have seen the damage that they've done in their local communities. So I think there's more of a desire to find these kind of green tech, eco tech jobs that are also socially responsible. So I think that the, these kinds of businesses and opportunities and technologies are great spaces and that there's, there's definitely young people that wanna get into that world too. Um, I'll just add, I think something people don't realize is that when you see the blue cars go by you here in Manhattan or Brooklyn or Bronx or wherever you are, um, that's a W2 driver. So something Revel has always done, even with our, you know, origin moped business that we started as a company in 2018, every single person at Revel is a W2 employee. Um, so that's just something we have always done. Hey, you. <laughs> uh, 
I had a lot of investor conversations along the way where they looked at me like I was crazy. You're going to go up against Uber and Lyft with W2 employees. I don't understand, um, but we're doing it. Um, so I'll, I'll just put that aside. Uh, we have about 1,500 drivers now, just to give you an idea of how many drivers we have employed. Um, that number will probably triple in the next year. So just continuing to to hire drivers and just pay them an hourly wage that makes sense. Uh, give them PTO, what a crazy idea. Um, and then the other piece of this is, yes, I mean, we're always looking to hire uh, folks in STEM. Uh, we have a 40 person engineering data product team. Um, I'm not a technical CEO or technical founder. I'm a former chef, um, environmental science degree. I'm as non-technical as it comes. Um, thankfully we have a CTO though. Um, uh, so always looking to hire there. Um, and then obviously we're, we're an operationally intensive business. So, uh, we probably have another hundred folks between rideshare operations, moped operations, infrastructure operations. Um, and those folks come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so we're always looking to hire either three of those buckets. Um, let's try to begin to wrap things up. Um, last, uh, sort of long form question. What uh, what would you like to say that I didn't ask a point that perhaps uh, you want to make? Is there, um, Sam, is there anything that you would uh, additionally you'd like to say? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, there's, I mean, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, well, uh, you know, one one thing that, that, that we've talked about quite a bit is is cost and charging. Um, chicken and the egg issue with with uh, light duty. It's it's somewhat the same uh, with heavy duty. Um, uh, 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 public charging is definitely going to be key in transitioning the class eight tractor trucks, drayage trucks included, um, and that is uh, that's something that we've been working a lot on at UCS with our partners uh, with the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. So, just wanted to share some good news in that front that um, the, the port of Oakland, which is the second largest port in California and one of the largest um, uh, ocean ports in uh, in the uh, in the country, uh, recently received a grant um, from the state of California that's going to increase our um, ability to support um, drayage trucks from 50 to over a thousand by the uh, by the end of uh, this grant's implementation. So things are headed in the right direction. Um, and we just have to keep passing bills like uh, 0279 to make sure that it that it accelerates. Didn't agree more. Uh, right. I, I'll, I'll just add one thing. I, I just feel like we're at a moment in time in 2023 where you can really feel the momentum of this EV transition, everything from the Inflation Reduction Act, which is very real for a company like us, uh, to federal grant funding opportunities, which is very real for a company like us to investor sentiment. Everybody feels like this is happening and we need to put money behind this. And then maybe for this conversation, just a sentiment of public-private partners really working together. Um, whereas maybe when I first started Revel in 2018, you didn't quite feel that yet with you know, urban mobility, electric mobility. Whereas now I feel like doors are being opened. People realize the only way we're going to make any progress is people coming together both on the public and private side. And I'm seeing it. Um, so it's exciting. And it needs to happen. Because nobody can do this alone. This is too hard. I think you said it. This is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, yeah, I think I um, I think just uh, something to keep in mind, like moving forward, is how the messaging and communication and rollout of all of this implementation happens, and how do we continue to. Um, maintain connection with local communities on how the rollout happens. You know, is it going to be certain fleets in certain neighborhoods and how, like, you know, just thinking, keeping, keeping those, those avenues of communication open and, and continuing to share where things are at, how it's working, what the technology is all about so that everyone remains part of that conversation and to start to hear, because I'm sure there will be things that we can't anticipate and challenges that we can't anticipate. So it's always like good to keep those modes of communication open and, and have as many people at the table as part of that implementation process and decision-making process of how it move for, moves forward and evolves. And, you know, a, as we create more of these coalitions between business and legislators and community organizations that 
everybody should be part of that and researchers as well. Like how do we create more spaces where we can have these conversations uh, in collective ways, I think is gonna be important and impactful. Daniel, any last thoughts? Um, I think just to say we need to all be keeping our eyes on the cities that are leading on this and they're cities you might not be expecting. It's places in Latin America. Latin America is absolutely the, the 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 leader in this process at the moment. We need to be learning from them, seeing how they're doing it, copying, replicating the, the, the things that are happening there. In the next few years, it will be India. Uh, there's a reason that we are working on this uh, new project together with um, uh, the Climate Pledge in India and Latin America is because they are, they're really leading the way. And I think that's incredibly exciting. There's a lot of uh, really exciting stuff coming out of Africa as well. I saw um, a... Kenyan manufacturer has just put the first electric bus on the road in Nairobi in the last couple of days. And I think uh, we talk a lot about leapfrogging in organizations like C40. This is really happening in this sector and that's really, really exciting for me. Okay, before we turn to the audience for questions, uh, I did want to do a lightning round. This is kind of fun. They're one word, uh, very short answers. Let's do one warm up. Um, what's your famous, your, your most favorite artist from New York, living or dead? Uh, Sonic Youth. Okay. Well, born and raised on Staten Island, so I guess I have to go Wu-Tang Clan, but that's more than one person. <laughs> I'd probably say my dad, Alex Harsley. He's a photographer. He's a gallery on 4th Street in the East Village where I grew up. I can't tap that answer. Um, I'm going to say the Beastie Boys. All right. So these next questions, that was just to get us slivered up a little bit. Um, so these are, I did not share these with the audience, uh, although I shared item two with Sam, just to make sure I wasn't I didn't look too up. far off, uh, off kilter. Um, the idea is yes or no, or a one sentence answer, very short. Um, just summarize the most important next step that New York City could take to tackle climate change, limit respiratory disease, or strengthen its reputation as a sustain sustainability business center. Data, collecting data and ensuring that uh, the the way that the bill is implemented is is in an equitable way because you know we see well that's more than the sentence I'll stop yeah <laughs> we can talk about it later. If you're building a public charging site, you move to the front of the utility upgrade queue. Do a lot. Say education and workforce development. Take all the best answers. It's rubbish to go last. Um, I'm <laughs> uh, just share your knowledge. Are you optimistic, neutral, or pessimistic that humanity can achieve net zero emissions by 2050? It depends on how much I've had to drink. <laughs> Generally optimistic. I mean, you have to be in this line of work. I'm a startup entrepreneur. You better be optimistic. So uh, we we got this. For the young people, optimistic. <laughs> this answer changes on an hourly basis, but uh, speaking to our mayors this week, very optimistic. And given the news we heard today about the uh, Zephyr New York City bill, how can one not be optimistic today? Uh, so the climate form. This relates to, to democracy. I mean, what we witnessed today is an effort that's taken some time to develop. A uh, legislative process moves somewhat slowly, but we we just learned that we're about to make tremendous progress, but that requires a functioning democracy. Will American democracy survive the 2024 election? I, I, I think for oh. equity's sake, we should start at the other end. <laughs> As a foreign, it's absolutely not my place to comment. <laughs> but for the world's sake, I certainly hope so. Maybe we'll get lucky and get something better. I've stopped listening to political podcasts. I just can't listen anymore. Yeah. Hot seat of miracle, all that stuff. I just, I just can't listen anymore. <laughs> we, we have made more progress in the past two years than we have in the past several decades so hopefully if something good happens in 2024 we can we can keep it going in the right direction and i would say we have to believe yeah okay. all right with that um there may be questions from the floor uh, this it's a pretty live room you can have a microphone if you like but 
Yeah, I have a question. Uh, for, I just want to preface, first of all, uh, Frank, who was dressed in the nicest, of, I actually didn't like you that much because you were dressed too nicely. But uh, <laughs> your message about charging is dead spot on. And I've had an EV for eight years. I've been in EV for 10 plus years in that you know industry. And one of the concerns I have, and I'm very happy that you mentioned about fast charging. So New York City rolled out this pilot charging program in a lot of neighborhoods that's super slow, it's level two, worthless. And I'll see it and they have two spots and people have to sit there for eight hours. Like it's totally worthless. And I was just curious, I know under de Blasio, he got rid of the requirement for garages. But what is the status of charger ready garages or at least charger ready, like when they're doing uh, development that they're making it uh, charger friendly. So they have conduit in place or anything like that. Because once they pour the sidewalks, they do the roads, they're not doing the upgrades. Like that's just not happening. So I'm curious if the, the Zev bill or anything else touches upon charging, because I agree with Frank, like there's only one EV on the market that people should look at, unfortunately. And it all relates to charging. When you want to drive someplace, you need a vehicle. Like my kid is looking at SUNYs. We drove up to Syracuse. Like we, we charged in the parking lot, but it was level two. So it was worthless. So on the way back, we had to go fast charging. So I'm curious, can you just answer what is the situation regarding charger ready, uh, the garages, the sidewalks, all that stuff? Can any of you talk to that? So you mentioned level two, your frustration with level two. Um, I share that frustration. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the example of, have you ever seen a gas pump on the curb? Why are we putting chargers on the curb? Should be behind private lots, private, just like gas stations, right? And that's exactly what we're building. We're building the gas stations of the future, right? Uh, you sample corner lot and putting 40 fast charging stalls. So you can always show up and get a charge and you get it fast and then go on with your life. Um, in terms of the regulations around, you know, bringing infrastructure, bringing conduit, bringing power to a building when it's being built to make sure there's six fast chargers in some condo complex, you know, it goes back to everything I've been saying on this panel. The grid is really maxed out. It's really constrained. It's really hard to get that power. Um, level two is a lot easier. Um, fast charging, you can only put it in specific locations where the grid can support it. Uh, it's really hard. And it's not just New York, you know, Bay Area, LA, Chicago, Boston, it's all the same story. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. In essence, you build a charger where the infrastructure exists. That's it. You don't try to bring infrastructure to places. Thank you. Yeah. And even if you have to bring the infrastructure to places, make sure the feeders and the upstream connection lines, whether it's PG&E or LADWP or Con Ed, they can support that. And those are only a few select areas in cities because everything's so maxed out. Can can I make a quick can I make a, just just a quick point about the difference between light duty and and heavy duty or particularly medium and heavy duty is that I think that level two is actually going to be um, a saving grace for most uh, most commercial vehicles and that they operate for eight hours a day and they sit there for the rest of the time. Um, uh, you we are working closely. Well, we're not working with UPS or USPS. We're we're lobbying USPS very hard um, to electrify their fleet as much as possible. And uh, it, it, even in some cases, uh, like basic level one charging could work for those vehicles. And and the reason why is because you know we we uh, is, is the way that they're operated in the duty cycle. Eighty percent of commercial vehicles in the U.S. travel less than hundred miles a day. And about 70% travel less than 70 miles a day. So you can easily get that range back. Um, so for example, you um, uh, DSNY's collection vehicles travel on average 14.6 miles a day. It's not very far. I mean, obviously with the, you know, a, a, a garbage collection vehicle, it's got a giant battery. It definitely needs level two, but um, uh, I, th I think it's, you know, they're sitting for a long time. It, just to be clear, my, uh, my hate for level two or the hate that I'm showing for level two um, that's more just when you're putting it, let's say on a curb somewhere. Um, it makes a lot of sense for fleets behind a fence. Uh, it totally makes sense. Um, yeah, Frank, let, let you said this, uh, hi, one time I worked in LA, I worked for Switch, where an EV charging company focused on deploying chargers in uh, multifamily buildings and commercial buildings. 
Um, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, hop back on, on your comment that um, the, the state is doing uh, quite a good amount for, for EV charging. Uh, notably, there's a incentive program from Nicerda that uh, really provides good incentives if you want to add charging in uh, your apartment building. And uh, I mean, I think it's really like an all of the above type of situation where if you don't want the on the go fast charging stations to be flooded with people, you have to provide them with a way to charge at home whenever that's possible. Um, and so if you live in an apartment building and you have a car in your garage, uh, you should have a charger uh, there. Um, so that's um, really what we, are, what, what we want to provide. Um, I, I have also a question for, for the panel, um, if um, I could just ask it. Uh, I'm curious, um, obviously, you know, transitioning uh, the, the NYC fleet to electric vehicles is, um, I mean, that's a, it's a commitment in terms of CapEx of, you know, putting the bill, buying these vehicles, especially if you're doing it faster than, than just them uh, being, you know, retired or just uh, the, the natural uh, switch of the fleet. Um, so I'm just curious, but at the same time, we know that the total cost of ownership of, of EVs is uh, lower or, or at parity with, um, with, fossil fuel uh, vehicles. So I'm curious of how, you know, just curious maybe specifically for this bill, like how does it work? How is it funded? Um, is it, you know, more expensive for the taxpayer or is it going to be savings for the taxpayer? And then maybe more generally, how seeing you know, sharing that information and, and, you know, making sure that that transition doesn't result in, you know, increased cost uh, for, for the taxpayer at the end. I mean, I, I'm not a member of government, but I can I can uh, tell you what we argued, and that is that um, the city will save money over time. It's a matter of perspective yeah. because um, zero emission vehicles are so much less expensive to operate and to maintain. And so um, we sent uh, Sam and I worked on a letter that we sent to Mayor Adams that went into detail on that. And if you look at all three classes of vehicles, uh, that's true. Um, by I think the the time frame is 2025 for all three classes 2030 for total cost for total cost um and it will progressively get better as the technology curve continues to and improve and new york city does have an option to help finance this that other cities have done and new york city itself has done just not for vehicles new york city can issue debt issue a green bond to help pay for it so there are ways uh, and there are state programs that New York City can take advantage of. There's certainly federal programs, uh, the IRA. So I think um, the city will be able to do this. Um, yeah, the IRA provisions are huge, actually. I mean, while we were writing that letter, uh, uh, Department of, uh, of the Federal Department of Revenue came out with, uh, with a rulemaking um, that interprets the IRA uh, 45W purchase credits and 30C um, uh, charging credits uh, uh, as uh, eligible to be awarded uh, to um, uh, non-tax liable entities, including cities. So it's up to $40,000 per vehicle uh, back from the federal government and 30% uh, up to $100,000 per charger. Um, but I think they have to be located in, uh, in poverty uh poverty census tract areas and urban areas, I think, but it's significant funding. Yeah, the Inflation Reduction Act is a 30% investment tax credit for fast charging infrastructure. Um, but there's some small, small print there that the IRS needs to confirm or else companies like us, we treat it as like, that could be a massive tailwind or it could be basically nothing. Depends on the small print. So one of them is what exactly is an environmental justice community? What data source are we using for that? We're building in cities mainly. So we generally check the box on building in lower income areas, but I need confirmation. Um, another one is, you know, what exactly is the total numerator that the 30% will be based off of? Is it just the charger? Is it all the switch gear and the infrastructure that goes into a big site behind the scenes that nobody sees? What about all the soft costs, all the attorneys and the zoning folks and the architects? So just like the, there's a lot of question marks about the IRA and the sooner they can just make it clear, the better a company like us can just plan and move forward. And is it real or is it not? Um, so right now we're considering it as this could be big. It could be a nothing burger if there's a lot of small print. It, it depends. I think we've got another question over here and then maybe we should, we should wrap it up and we can, we can stay in chat. Oh, 
Switching to electric and saving on gas because they're charging fast charging the time. So you do kind of need like a good mix of fast charging and level two charging so people can get some of the savings back on to up on cost of paying for the electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. no, good, good point. Actually, we're very close to being on time. I was hoping we. Would it be done around 7 30? Is there any other question before we wrap up? One more? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Margaret. I'm with Z Solutions and we build and operate zero emission truck depots, um, but also looking at light, medium, and heavy duty. And um, I really appreciate the focus on charging infrastructure. I can't echo that anymore. And so uh, something that we've been exploring and, and trying to wrap our heads around a little more is. Uh, interim charging solutions, um, kind of ways to bring power to a site or um, charge vehicles without um, needing that utility interconnect. Uh, what do you see uh, the role of that uh, kind of technology playing, especially in a city like New York, and also the viability or even any examples of that? So for heavy duty vehicles and in, in terms of implementing the advanced clean fleets rule in California, that's going to be huge. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but there is someone that is developing a product that's essentially a uh, storage container, a 20 foot equivalent storage container that's full of, of batteries. And they can drop that off to the fleet and it's it's kind of ready to go. Um, I, don't, I don't think it requires any interconnection uh, permits or anything like that. So that that's going to be um, uh, something or a piece of technology that's going to be really helpful in implementing advanced clean fleets and avoiding um, some of the exemptions in that rule. Um, so hope to see more of that. Yeah, I wanted to say school buses can play a really productive role because their duty cycle is so specific. And so they those big batteries that school buses need for only a certain number of hours a day, you can reverse them. So vehicle to grid technology, they can help New York City um, mitigate uh, sort of the increased demand that, that, that we'll need for electricity. So it's really important we urge the city to focus on school buses early because they're part of the solution of making it easier to charge vehicles and can play a really productive role. I think we're a little bit past our time. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was wonderful to have this panel and have such fantastic news from majority leader power. So um, now we've got to figure out how do we how do we leverage this and how do we do more. Thank you. I don't think we've had. No, we didn't. Daniel. Daniel, Frank. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Hey, come on. Yeah. Great to meet you.